All right, Daniel Lieberman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So you are a Harvard professor, professor of biological anthropology. You've studied the evolution of physical activity in humans all your career. And you yourself are someone who's a marathoner. You're into fitness. But as you observe in your book, Exercised, a lot of people struggle to exercise, even though they know it's good for them, they should be doing it. And the doctor probably might have said to them, you need to start exercising more. And one reason you, you make this case in your book, our bodies really aren't evolved for exercise. Well, it's not really so much that the human body didn't evolve to exercise. It's really the human mind that didn't evolve to exercise. So, you know, so exercise is a kind of physical activity. So, you know, physical activity is just moving, right? When you go downstairs to make yourself a cup of tea or, or walk the dog or, or carry groceries across the supermarket or go hunting or, or whatever, that's all physical activity. And exercise is discretionary, voluntary physical activity that we undertake for the sake of health and fitness. So we did evolve to be active. It's just that. Nobody ever evolved to go for a five-mile jog in the morning, or nobody evolved to go to the gym and lift weights whose sole purpose was to be lifted. That's a really very modern, strange behavior that essentially we created after the Industrial Revolution when, when we created, you know, when we have all these machines that do our work for us. And so people don't have to do labor anymore in certain parts of the world, and we've had to substitute exercise for the physical activity that we used to have to do. I feel like your book argues that studying our ancestors can help us wrap our minds around this very modern thing of exercise, but not in the way the popular culture thinks. You know, like part of your book is about what the positive things are, what we can actually learn from our ancestors. And we're going to talk about that here in a bit. But part of it's also about debunking the myths around what we can learn from our ancestors about exercise. And one myth that seems to kind of underlie all the other myths is what you call the myth of the athletic savage. I'm guessing you're playing off the idea of the noble savage here. What do you mean by the myth of the athletic savage? Well, we have this sort of idea, it's a very popular idea out there, that you know, modern human beings, people like you and me and and people listening to this have been sort of contaminated by civilization, you know, because we have shoes and Gatorade and you know, fancy watches and and all that sort of stuff that that we've sort of no longer the kind of great athletes that we were, you know, that humans are normally meant to be. And so you get this idea that if you know people in like just just like the myth of the noble savage, you know, that 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 people who are uncontaminated by civilization are naturally good and perfect and their children don't go through adolescence and all that sort of stuff. We have this idea that, you know, people who aren't contaminated by civilization can get up in the morning and just run ultra marathons and that they're incredibly strong and that, you know, and that they don't get injured and that they're flexible and, you know, the list goes on, right? And I find that really troubling and disturbing because it's actually kind of not only is it not true, but it's also very dehumanizing. You know, the people in other parts of the world, when they participate in in impressive physical activity, you know, in long races or whatever, it's not easy for them either. And they're, they're working hard, they're trying, and they do it because they care, because it's worth it to them. And and I think we need to get rid of this myth. Well, so yeah, I think a lot of times when we think about, oh, we should exercise because our hunter-gatherer ancestors moved all the time and were strenuous all the time. But part of your work is you go to, you know, we can't go back in time and see how people tens of thousands of years ago has actually lived. But we, you know, you can look at hunter-gatherer societies that exist today and get an idea of what it was like. So when you actually go visit and you do, and you study, like, like an anthropologist, like do the field work, how, how do hunter-gatherer people actually move their bodies and their level of physical activity? <laughs> Well, so most of my research is not actually on hunter-gatherers. I study subsistence farmers. We've been looking at the transition from farming to urban lifestyle in Kenya and in Mexico. But I have had the, the, the good fortune to go spend some time with hunter-gatherers and read the literature. So, so the data I've collected hasn't really been on hunter-gatherers. I certainly report a lot of those data in my book. And, but when you spend time with hunter-gatherers, or for that matter, people who don't have machines and cars and you know roads and shoes and all that sort of stuff— they're not actually all that different from us. They're they're physically active in, in the sense that they do have to work, but they don't work a huge amount every day. A typical hunter-gatherer works about two, two and a quarter hours a day. And if you hang out in camp, which I've had the good fortune to do, most of the time people are just doing what you know we're doing, which is kind of hanging out. They sit about 10 hours a day. They're, you know, they're doing chores. They're you know, taking care of their kids. They're you know gossiping. And they're really you know out only about half the day doing, doing work. And it's mostly not that strenuous. Mm-hmm. And they're not super strong. They're just kind of average, ordinary people. But but they're struggling to get food, right? It's not easy for them to get food. And so, so when food is limited, right? When energy is limited, then you have to engage in trade-offs, just like time, right? Time is a clearly limited 
resource, right? So the time that you're spending listening to me now is time that you're not spending doing something else that's probably more useful, right? And and the same is true of energy, right? Cal- if I like, I went for a five mile run this morning, just for the sake of going for a five mile run. But if I were energy limited and already had to be physically active to actually survive, those 500 calories that I spent. Uh, I could have much better used for reproduction, for taking care of my body, for all kinds of good things. Well, speaking of running, uh, you begin the book kind of sort of showing the dichotomy of how people think about exercise. So you talk about us in the West, yeah, you go for a five mile run just because there's people who dedicate their lives to training for ultra marathons and every day they're running. But then you also talk about this group of people, I think it's the Tara Humara in Mexico, the, these are the, the folks, they, they do, they have like a ritual basically where they run like a race, a really long race, barefoot oftentimes, or just wearing sandals. I think Born to Run really popularized. Yeah, they, they do not run barefoot, by the way. That's right. one of the myths. Of okay, them, so another myth. Out. But, so, but they yeah. wear kind of like sandals, right? <laughs> I think I, like a very minimal shoe oftentimes. Yeah. But, you know, I think you, you talk to them and you, you, you tried, I think you, you talked about how you explained them. Yeah. What do you think about like Americans? Like they run every day, like 10 miles a day. Why don't you guys do that? Like to get ready for this long race. And they kind of looked at you like, that's weird. Why would you, why would you run 10 miles every day if you didn't have to? Like, I just do this race when I, cause it means something to us and that's it. Yeah. Well, that was really the origin of the book. Look, the reason the book is titled exercised is because People today are exercised about exercise. They're nervous, they're anxious, and they're, they're confused, and they're fed all kinds of myths, and they don't know how, what to think. And, and I think the biggest myth about exercise is that you're sort of, it's normal and natural to do, and that if you don't do it, there's something wrong with you, and you're lazy. And, and yes, it is good for you. I'm not arguing that exercise is bad for you. But it's important to realize that you know just going for a five-mile run for the sake of going for a five-mile run is a very strange and modern behavior. And so you know that, to me, was made crystal clear when I was doing the first time I went to do research with the Tara Humara. And I was talking to some runners and, you know, interviewing them about how they get ready to run. And this was my first time down there. And I was trying to ask them about how they trained. I had my list of, you know, I was being a good anthropologist. I had my list of questions. And everybody was sort of really confused about this question because there's no, apparently there's no word for training in, in Ramamari, the, the language that they speak. And so the translator I was working with was working really hard to try to explain this. And and there was this one guy, she was basically saying, look, you know, this gringo, he runs like five miles every morning in order to get ready to, you know, to run races. And he looked at me with astonishment. He said, why would anybody run if they didn't have to? And, and I remember laughing a little bit out of embarrassment, but that was that moment I suddenly realized, you know, exercise is yet another one of these very modern things that we, we have a very sort of strange attitudes towards. It, yes, it's good for us, but let's not pretend that it's abnormal to dislike exercise. Remember, 80% of Americans don't get the minimum levels of physical activity that, that, that are recommended by every health organization on the planet, right? And it's not that there's something wrong with those folks. They're actually kind of normal. And, and we need to understand that in order to help them do better. So yeah, running is, or exercise is weird. Exercise is weird. Absolutely. There's lots of other weird things that we do. I mean, think about, well, I mean, obviously right now we're talking over a computer and, and reading is weird, right? Until recently, nobody read. I mean, reading is a completely modern behavior. A few thousand years ago, not a human being on the planet read. You know, our, our lives are filled with weird things and they're not necessarily bad, but we have to, it's, it's useful to step out of our kind of normal life and, and think about uh, how our world has changed and understand how, how that affects the way we can, we can do better. So one thing you do in one chapter, you explore, you know, how we think about exercise a day. You, to figure that out, you explore like what happens when our bodies do nothing, when they're inactive. So like what, so like what, first off, what happens, what's going on in our bodies and we just kind of not do anything. And then what insights can we get about exercise by understanding what's going on in our bodies when we're inactive? Well, that's a huge question, <laughs> but I'll try to, I'll try to kind of nail it to the, you know, focus on the key issues. The first is when we're doing nothing, we're just sitting around on a couch or, you know, just hanging out. Our bodies are actually doing a lot, right? Two thirds of the metabolic energy, the energy that you spend every day are just taking care of the basic functions of your body, right? So during rest, your body's actually spending a lot of calories, taking care of your brain and, t- you know, regenerating all the cells and, throughout your body and, you know, keeping you healthy and fighting disease. And, you know, the list is very, very long. You spend about, typical human male spends probably about 16, 1700 calories a day just, just existing, right? And when we exercise, we, we do two things. First of all, we spend energy just moving, right? So muscles 
you know, muscles consume a lot of energy, as we all know. So when we, when we lift heavy weights or, or go for a run or, or whatever it is you like to do, you're spending energy to do that movement, you know, to pay for the, the cost of the muscle, but you're also stressing your body. You're generating all kinds of little bits of damage. You're, you're creating little micro cracks in your bone and your muscle. Your, 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 your mitochondria are producing what are called reactive oxygen species. These are, these are highly reactive molecules that has more or less rust your body, you know, like, like an apple when it turns brown. Your DNA is mutating. You're producing, you're producing waste products like lactate. And one of the things that exercise does is it also turns on all kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms that keep our bodies functioning really well. And here's the key, because we never evolved not to be physically active, right? Nobody ever could be a couch potato 24-7 back in the old days, right? Uh, we never evolved to turn on these repair and maintenance mechanisms as effectively as, you know, just sitting around, right? And so that's really the key as to why exercise, you know, physical activity in general, but exercise in particular, is so healthy. Because without it, we our bodies basically break down, right? And, and, and physical activity keeps our bodies young and healthy. But then there's also a point that there's kind of a, there's two things going on there. The other, on the other side though, is like your body from an evolutionary standpoint, they don't want to expend calories or energy that they don't, doesn't have to expend for survival or reproduction. So there's sort of a battle. Okay. You need to move to repair your body and keep yourself physically healthy. But it's like, if you go too much, it's like, wow, man, that's calories. I could have (laughs) stayed, you know, I could have kept on for that famine that's going to come in a couple of months. Right, yeah. So back back in, until recently, you know, people were calorie limited. They struggled to get enough calories, right? And but they were also very physically active because every calorie they got in their body was the result of work that they had to do. You had to go out and, you know, forage for plants. You had to go out and get honey. You had to go out and hunt animals. You had to go out and do everything, right? There there was no machines to do anything for you whatsoever. And so there was no way not to be physically active. As I said before, you know, the average hunter gatherer is and spends about two and a quarter hours a day in moderate to vigorous physical activity, right? And so in conditions like that, you know, if you spend any extra energy on physical activity that doesn't benefit you in some way, that's not a good idea. So so we evolved to be physically active for two reasons and two reasons only, right? When it was necessary and when it was rewarding, right? So, you know, our ancestors also played, they danced, they did fun things, right? And But that also has benefits. It has social benefits. It has, you know, playing is important for developing capacities. Play is important for developing social skills. Play is important for learning not to be, you know, reactively aggressive and, you know, learn, learn good sportsmanship. Dancing is, of course, every culture on the planet also has dancing and dancing is great for finding mates and enjoying yourself and telling stories and, you know, healing, who knows what. But so, those are the reasons we were physically active, but, you know, going to the gym is, you know, work. And, you know, for me, the obviously sort of apotheosis of sort of how absurd exercise is, is a treadmill, right? That's why it's on the cover of the book, right? Because, you know, a treadmill, you think about it, you pay a lot of money to either to go to a gym or buy one yourself to work on a machine that gets you absolutely nowhere. It gets, you know, it's, you know, it's good for you, but it's a very, very strange thing. Imagine trying to explain that to your, you know, great, 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 great grandparents. So, I mean, that's part of the reason why what makes being motivated to exercise so hard, at least the way we think of exercise today. It's like, there's not really any immediate reward. It doesn't get you food. It doesn't allow you to survive. And if you're on a treadmill, it's like, well, that's not really motivating. So you're just like, well, your body's like, well, you know what? Not really worth it. I think I'll just sit on, I'll just stay home and take it easy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I hate treadmill. I put people on treadmills for a living and I can't stand using a treadmill. I always, I have to coerce myself in various ways. You know, I have to watch something on TV or listen to a podcast or something. It's the only way I can ever tolerate a treadmill. All right. So we need to move for health, for survival. But again, there's this sort of battle. We don't want to move too much because there's, there's like no immediate reward for that. And we need to save calories. So we're, we're battling against that a little bit. But going into, you know, Going further than this idea of inactivity, one thing you've seen, you know, people or health websites, magazines, books hit really hard is this idea of that sitting. Sitting is the new smoking. And we've had, I think we've had someone, a pod, we've had a podcast about this. I've talked about the benefits of standing desks on the website. And so when I read, I read this, like, well, is, is sitting really the new smoking? What does the research say about that? Yeah. So I think sitting is a, it's like a perfect example of how we make people exercised about, about exercise and health and bodies, et cetera, right? Look, everybody knows you don't need to be a scientist or, you know, doctor or whatever to, to realize that 
too much sitting is bad for you. I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? But what we've done is, you know, to, to exercise people about it, right? We've now claimed that sitting is the new smoking and that your chair is out to kill you. I mean, and you don't, I mean, if I were just an average ordinary person hearing somebody tell me that sitting is like, like a cigarette, I would get suspicious, right? Cause it's obviously, you know, a, a cigarette is a, is a form of toxin, you know, it's, it's poison that you're ingesting into your body. And how can something as normal and, and basic as sitting be that bad for you, right? And I think if you look more carefully at the data, it turns out that yes, if you sit too much, that's a problem, but, but it's actually mostly leisure time sitting, which is associated with negative health outcomes. So people who work, you know, at a job and then are sitting at their desk, you know, much of the day, they're doing fine if they're still exercising and walking to work and, you know, doing all those other sorts of things. The folks who are really in trouble are the ones who, you know, sit at their desk all day. And then when they, and then also they're sitting in their car to get to work and then they're sitting in their car to get home and then they're sitting all evening long and, and basically they're never doing any physical activity. So that's, that's one issue. We, we, we shouldn't demonize sitting. Secondly, it turns out that sitting is completely normal. I mean, you know, my dog spends the day sitting all over the house. Hunter gatherers sit 10 hours a day. So let's not pretend sitting is something abnormal and modern. And then third, it turns out that there are healthier and less healthy ways to sit. So many studies show that what really matters is how long you sit for, what's called active sitting. So you and I might both sit 10 hours a day, but if I get up every 10 minutes and you get up only every 40 minutes, my health outcome is going to be much, much better than yours. And that's because you're turning on, when you turn on muscles, even even just a little bit, it's like turning on your car, you're turning on all kinds of and you're turning on the engine, you're, you're using up some fats and, and sugars in your bloodstream, you're turning on all kinds of genes, it's, you know, it's really healthy. Or if you like sitting in a chair that requires you to use some muscles, like right now, um, I'm sitting at the edge of my chair, I, I have a standing desk and I often stand up, but, but, but I'm not using a backrest, right? And so I'm having to use back muscles to kind of stabilize my upper body. And again, that's using a little bit of energy, it's not a lot of energy, but it's still kind of healthier than the kind of more passive sitting uh, that people do. So let's not tell people that sitting is the new smoking. Let's help people get the correct information about how to sit a little bit more healthily and uh, and stop scaring them. Well, and you, what I love about this chapter too is you explore, okay, if you're inactive or you sit for the, like a long period of time, that leisure sitting, you, you get into the research, like what's going on? Like, why is it bad for your body? And then basically it's your, your body... Uh, there's just like a low grade inflammation going on when you're inactive for long periods of time, and that can cause all sorts of problems. Correct, exactly. So, so, so sitting can be pro-inflammatory for two reasons. The first is that you can add fat. So, if you're sitting all day long and you're not getting any exercise, any excess energy you're taking in, well, your body will store as fat, and that fat can cause this kind of low grade inflammation. You're basically, your body is starting to attack yourself. And then the other reason is that if you're not being physically active and you're not using your muscles, it turns out your muscles are the major tissues, right? The major tissues that actually produce molecules that turn down inflammation. They're called myokines. And, and so, you know, you have a lot more muscle than white blood cells, which are also regulating inflammation. So when you're active, you're, you're not only preventing yourself from storing up excess fat, which promotes inflammation, you're also turning on your muscles, which then turn down inflammation. So, so sitting a lot and being physically inactive is kind of a double whammy in that regard. But, but here's the good news. You don't need a huge amount of physical activity to get those benefits. You know, it's not like you have to, you know, run a marathon or, or go to the gym and lift, you know, ridiculous amounts of weight, and do CrossFit workouts. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with any of that sort of stuff, but, but you don't need that to get the benefits. All right. So don't, don't beat yourself about sitting down. Most of humans around the world, even hunter gatherers, they spend a lot of time sitting. They just are a little bit more active when they sit. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not really very complicated. Well, here's a question. So I've got like that feature on my iWatch where it like tell, reminds me to stand. Am I exercising myself? <laughs> like, am I being exercised by sitting by having that feature? Or is that do you think that be is that helpful? No, it's cool. It's fine. I mean, look, whatever makes you happy, right? I mean, there's lots of ways to use technology. I mean, I'm not opposed to technology. And just because it's new doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I try to find ways to force myself to get up every once in a while too. I don't have an eye watch, but I, you know, I, I intentionally have a coffee mug that gets cold, right? So I go and, re- you know, warm it up again and things like that. Or my dog comes and bothers me on a regular basis and I have to scritch her. And, you know, I'm constantly trying to get up. I'm a fidgeter too. So that helps me. But, you know, whatever works for you is fine. There's no, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, let a thousand different ways of 
you know, interrupting your sitting bloom, whatever works for you. Well, another idea you explore in the book is how, you know, there's this idea that humans were evolved for endurance activities. Yeah. And, you know, they'll point to, you know, persistent hunters. I'm, I think people have seen that YouTube video of, I think it's in Africa, these guys who just chase this gazelle or this antelope for miles until it just passes out and dies. And then they they do it like, well, yeah, if, if humans evolved to do that, well, then maybe we should run ultra marathons is the, <laughs> the conclusion. Well, can you talk a little bit about what we know about humans and endurance activities? And is it, should we make that, I, I imagine the answer is no, but should we make that jump from, well, we did, we're really good at persistent hunting. So maybe we should also run ultra marathons. Well, I'm partly to, res- to blame for this, this idea, right? Because the research that I've done for many years has been on the evolution of hunting. And, and we were the, you know, my colleague Dennis Bramble and I published that paper in, in Nature in 2004. It was entitled Born to Run that kind of got a lot of this started, right? And I do believe there's no question that humans evolved to run long distances, and we evolved that around 2 million years ago in order to become scavengers and hunters. It's really important for us. And, and we have all kinds of adaptations in our bodies, literally from our heads to our toes, that make us exceptional at long distance running. But, you know, they didn't like do that on a regular basis. They didn't do it really fast. And you don't necessarily need to do that in order to get the health benefits of physical activity. So if you like to run marathons, which I do, right, that's great. If you like to run ultra marathons, that's also great. But we have this idea that just because our ancestors did those kinds of runs that, you know, that's something that we necessarily have to do. And, and, and that's certainly not the case. It's, it's something that's built into us. And, and endurance is definitely important for human health. I mean, if you look at every sort of study of the effects of physical activity on health, there's no question that that cardio, you know, that endurance physical activity is sort of the bedrock of every major program, right? And it's really good for you in a, a thousand ways. It's good for your brain. It's good for your metabolism. It's good for your, your cardiovascular system, on and on and on. In fact, and in fact, we've published studies which show that, you know, even if you do a lot of weight training, it's the absence of cardio that can, can result in some degree of, of, of health risk. So, so everybody should do some cardio. But you don't need to do an enormous amount of cardio to get the benefits. But on the other hand, if you if you like doing ultra marathons or marathons, that's also fine too. And people are always worrying about it if you can exercise too much. Really, there's there's very little evidence that you can exercise too much. Of course, there are very few people who actually get out there in terms of that that those distances, and so there's not a lot of information really. Well, could we backtrack a little bit, like talk about the adaptations that make us great endurance. Athletes, I put that in oh, quotation gosh. marks. So, There's like, so I know, yeah, like we sweating. Sweating hours, is yeah. one, right? So, like, humans can sweat. Most animals can't sweat. What else has made us good? So, at- we have thermoregulatory adaptations. We have metabolic adaptations. We have genes that help us, you know, have higher aerobic capacity. Um, in terms of musculoskeletal adaptations, we have springs in our feet. We have long Achilles tendons. We have short toes. The gluteus maximus, which you know most of us are sitting on, right? That's a muscle that's enlarged in order to make us really good at running. We have specialized stabilizers in our head, our arms. When we pump our arms, we have abilities to actually use our arms to balance our head, to keep our heads from bouncing so much. We have a ton of features in our bodies that make us really, really good at long distance running. And that we can see many of these evolved around 2 million years ago and have been important parts of our evolutionary history. Until recently, pretty much, you know, running was something that everybody had to do. You couldn't be a hunter back in the old days unless you could run. And hunting was a very important part of our evolutionary history. But we live in a world today where we don't have to do that anymore. And, and a lot of people have lost the skill of running very well, and it's, which is too bad because I think it's, it's the most fundamental, basic kind of vigorous physical activity. But yeah, so it's, it's, it's certainly part of who we are. In part of your research, you, you raced a horse in a long distance, or a bunch of horses in a long distance <laughs> Yeah, race. that wasn't so much for research. That was kind of to put my money where my, my mouth was. Because, you know, I've been writing about persistence hunting, and, and you know, I'm not going to you know, try to run a kudu down in the Kalahari. Uh, that's actually illegal. So I thought what I would do is uh, try to join one of these man against horse races. So I ran one in, uh, in Prescott, Arizona a few years ago and I had a blast. It was a lot of fun. And you beat some horses. Yeah, it was actually yeah. not too bad. I mean, look, yeah. I'm a middle-aged professor. I'm not a super fast runner by any stretch of the imagination. And there were, I think, 40... 41 runners and 53 horses, I think, that year. I can't remember the exact numbers. And I beat all but 13 of the horses. So I beat like 40 horses. And, and the horses, by the way, get a veterinary checkup, which the, which is subtracted from their time, which the runners don't get. So, uh, so, uh, you know, we, we had a kind of a, horses had like a handicap. So another idea that 
is out there because of this athletic savage myth is that hunter-gatherer ancestors are caveman ancestors. What do you want to say? They were a lot stronger than we are today. <laughs> yeah. uh, what is your research found about that? Well, they're not. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and it's actually kind of easy to explain why. I mean, look, if you spend time with, with forages, they're, they're certainly strong. I mean, they're not weaklings by any stretch of the imagination. And, and they're also kind of thin too. So their muscles kind of really pop out too. So, but, but they're not jacked up, you know, they're not like, like weightlifters. And in fact, it would be problematic for them to do that because, because muscle's really expensive. If you, you know, anybody who's gone on a, on a serious, um, you know, weightlifting uh, regime and really trying to bulk up, you know, you know, you have to eat a lot more because muscles are very expensive. They're costly tissues. And so extra muscle, the reason we have this kind of use it, lose it kind of biology is that, you know, you want to put on muscle when you need it, but you don't want any extra muscle for when, because otherwise you have to, you know, you need ex, you need hundreds of extra calories every day to pay for that, all that muscle mass, right? And if you're struggling to get enough calories, you know, too much muscle is just not a good thing. And, and the kinds of tasks that our ancestors did, you know, required some degree of strength, but not a huge amount of strength. So, so, you know, hunter-gatherers are, you know, they're moderately strong. They're like, you know, grip strength tests suggest they're about, you know, 75th percentile for, for standard Americans or Brits or something like that. Um, but the key thing is that as they age, they, they remain relatively strong, right? Because they're still using their bodies as they get older. Whereas a lot of Americans, for example, as we get older, we, um, we end up getting a, a disease called sarcopenia, where we get wasting of our muscles, and, and that is a really serious thing because that kind of frailty leads to a vicious circle, right? You know, we've all seen elderly people who have trouble getting out of chairs and they end up walking really slowly and, you know, tasks become, become more difficult. They, they become compromised in their ability to, to, to function. And when that happens, then you become less physically active, which keeps driving that cycle forward, right? And so as we get older, it's, Exercise is not less important. Exercise becomes more important. And, and that's one of the reasons why it's so critical as we get older in this modern world where we've got machines to do everything for us that we, that we, that we do weights, right? You know, it's good to do, you know, at least two bouts of resistance training a week as you get older in kind of Western environments like ours because it prevents that kind of muscle wasting. It's really critical. Now, this chapter resonated with me because I'm a, I, I lift weights. That's my chosen modality of physical fitness and yeah like muscle is clear like the worst part of like i do powerlifting. the worst part is often the eating part because you just have to like <laughs> eat all and you're like i don't yeah. want to eat this like i don't want to eat this but you <laughs> if you want to and then also you know my coach my barbell coach makes this point about when it comes to strength training it says with strength training there's like a meter like you there's a, you'll reach a point where okay exercise you need to do strength changes for general health right if you want if you're an older person so you can get up off the floor get up off the toilet you know avoid that what you talked about the degradation of muscle but then he says if you there's a point where strength training becomes unhealthy and you're you're basically training for competition you know you, you don't says you don't need to deadlift 600 pounds but if you want to you have to understand like there are risk of going after that goal and of course i went after the goal and i did it. and it was i mean it, i look at my what i'm doing i'm like I could not do this if I lived in 1700s. This would not be possible because I wouldn't have one the food to be able to do it, and I just wouldn't have the time. It's kind of it's a luxury when you step back and think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, it's as, it's as strange as you know my running five miles this morning for no reason at all, right? Except my running five miles this morning was probably a little bit on the healthier side than you're trying to deadlift. Well, I don't know how many hundred pounds. Six hundred pounds. Did, but, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's impressive. Yeah, <laughs> not, not 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 something I ever want to do. I, yeah, I have to say I struggle to do weights. Uh, but okay, but the idea that though you, we do need strength training because especially when, as you get older, because you want to avoid that uh, muscle degradation. It's critical. Yeah, yeah we need, all need to be like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And and the good news is really cool evidence is that as you get older, right? You know, you're it's 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 inevitable that you won't stay as strong. But it's there are studies showing like an eighty year old people, 90-year-old people, when they do strength training, they still get the benefits, right? They're, they can still put on muscle. You know, you can't put on as much muscle in your 80s as you can in your 20s, but you can you can still recruit, you know, the the stem cells to uh, add muscle mass. So there's, it's never too late to, to try to do this. Let's talk about this other idea that you explore in the book that was always interesting. So we got two, I think people have heard two conflicting messages about exercising from the popular health press. One is you need exercise to lose weight because it burns calories. But then they also see research saying, well, actually, no, exercise doesn't do much for weight loss. It's all diet. And so they're like, what do I, what do, I do? Like, should I exercise? So which one is it? 
Yeah, that's a that's a perfect example of how exercise we are about exercise and how we get fed these little kind of sound bites. You know, this one study comes out and this other study comes out. People just get whiplash and they get confused and they have no idea how to con- uh, interpret what's going on. And so, and weight loss is you know, nothing. Nothing seems to top weight loss in terms of this regard. So, so it is true. If you're trying to lose weight, you are way better off dieting than exercising because you know, if I, like, like for example, I went for a five mile run this morning. I burned 500 calories. But if I had just basically, you know, not eaten a few slices of bacon, I could easily have not had those 500 calories, right? So it's just way easier to go into what we call negative energy balance through dieting than exercise. So that's kind of where a lot of the don't bother exercising to lose weight idea comes. The other, of course, the issue is that uh, when you exercise, you get hungry. <laughs> and so you make up some of those, those calories that you, you otherwise um, spent, which is also true. But it turns out that um, a lot of the, the experiments that have been done have been done on really kind of modest levels of exercise. Remember, the, the kind of minimum that everybody recommends is 150 minutes a week. That's what the World Health Organization says every human being should do. So a lot of the studies look at just 150 minutes a week of, of sort of moderate physical activity. That's like 21 minutes a day of going for a brisk walk, right? Which burns like, you know, it burns like like 50 calories. It's not a lot of, a lot of energy, right? And so surprise, surprise, people who do that kind of very short, you know, those modest levels of physical activity, which is good for them, they're not losing weight or they're not losing very much weight. But but studies that look at more exercise uh, do find that it actually is effective for losing weight. And even more importantly, but you're not going to lose a lot of it, you know, or, or really rapidly. So if you're really trying to lose a lot of pounds, you know, exercise is just not going to do for it. But you, But you can lose weight slowly and gradually by exercising. But more importantly, Exercise has been shown, physical activity has been shown to help us prevent weight gain or weight regain. So a lot of people on diets, they lose the weight and then it comes crashing back again after the diet is over, right? But physical activity has been shown to help us not gain weight in the first place, but also to help not regain weight once you've lost it. And there are lots of studies. A a good one, one I cite in the book, for example, is one that was done here in Boston on, on policemen. So they had a bunch of policemen who were, you know, overweight and they had had them go on a serious diet, and some went on a diet and exercise, and some just died alone. And then after that, they all lost you know tons of weight. They all lost a lot of pounds. I can't remember exactly. And then after the diet was over, the ones who continued to exercise kept the weight off, and the ones who didn't continue to exercise just they went right back up to their original weight. And that's one of just many, many, many studies. So, so you know, let's not exaggerate the benefits of exercise for weight loss, but let's also not completely discount them. And I think at part. Pretty much everybody kind of knows that intuitively too. Right. I think so too. So, I mean, I think what you're trying to do in this book and you kind of in this, in your book talking about this is that you get going, you don't want people to be exercised or like frustrated or whatever about exercise. And we saw like a lot of these myths that we have about exercise in the popular culture, you know, our hunter gatherer ancestors, like they, they ran all the time. Yeah. They, sometimes they ran long distance, but most of the time they sat around just like us. Sitting isn't bad for you. Don't feel bad about that. You know, endurance. Yes. We evolved to run long distance, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you have to do that. And, but I think you, you what your I think your goal here is you want people to not feel frustrated or flush about exercise, and you know that exercise is good for them. You want people to exercise, but like just don't beat yourself up about what type of exercise or how much you do. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the way in the modern world what we've done with exercise, we've 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 done with exercise what we've done with so many other things. We've commodified it, we've industrialized it, we've commercialized it, we've medicalized it, right? We prescribe it. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. I mean, I, I, I like to buy fancy schmancy things and I, you know, I talk to, there's, you know, medical exercise is healthy, right? So it's doctors should tell their, their patients to, to be physically active, but it doesn't work for everybody. Right. And medicalizing and prescribing things is, is just clearly not enough. And it confuses people and it makes people irritated and pissed off. Sometimes, you know, people nag and brag about exercising and, you know, I call those folks exorcists. So really the <laughs> argument of the book is to, is to let's step away from this industrialized, commercialized, commodified, medicalized view of exercise. And let's use as the lenses of anthropology and evolution to think about it. And when you do that, you know, a lot of these myths just disappear. And a lot of these things that are so confusing and complicated just sort of disappear because it's, you know, we, we evolved to be physically active, but we also didn't evolve to, to run marathons and to, you know, and to, you know, do crazy stuff. And we never evolved to sit around all day long. And, and, you know, we evolved to basically move when it was necessary and fun. So the simple, the simple solution is to, is to make moving necessary and fun in this strange world we live in, where we, now we have to choose to be physically active 
instead of have to be physically active. And and we just made it needlessly, you know, confusing and complicated. Yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway that we can learn from our ancestors if we want to start exercising regularly. We just got to figure out how to make exercise necessary and fun. And with the fun part, we've had a, a, a actually a psychologist on the podcast talking about that. And she just says, yeah, do something that you enjoy. But the way you figure out what you enjoy is you have to try a bunch of different stuff. And maybe you figure out that you like running, maybe you like weightlifting, maybe it's yoga, tennis, whatever. But with the necessary part of the equation, how do you make something that's unnecessary necessary without infringing on somebody's autonomy? <laughs> yeah, well, I had fun going to the Bjorn Borg company, which actually requires all its workers to exercise. But, you know, I think the way to, to tell people to do that is to make it social, right? For most people, right, the things that are most fun, are the, that's, that's one of the things that's been problematic with this pandemic is we don't see each other anymore, right? But being social is 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 a fantastic way to be physically active. So like this morning was a perfect example for me. Every Thursday morning, I, I go running with some friends. We do track workouts. And I didn't want to go this morning, you know, it was, it's kind of cold here and it's kind of gray and, and, you know, it's like, but I, I have to be out there. And, and I went out there and we were all like pushing each other and helping each other do intervals. And, and it was a lot of fun and I'm really glad I went. Right. And if I hadn't, you know, we hadn't emailed each other the night before saying, Hey, we're going to all meet this morning at eight o'clock. I probably wouldn't have been out there, but I'm, I'm really glad I did it. Cause that kind of forced me to go. And then when I was there, it gave me all the like, feedback and encouragement that I needed to kind of, you know, haul my body around the around the track and and uh, it was a good thing and uh, you know there's lots of ways to do that go dancing or you know meet a friend for a walk or 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 you know a game of soccer or whatever it is that you like to do there's tons of ways to do it but but making it social is one of many ways but i think it's the most basic simple and fundamental way to to help make exercise both necessary and fun yeah never underestimate peer pressure absolutely use it for good but use it for positive (laughs) stuff (laughs) All right. Well, Daniel, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, so we have a website. If you just kind of Google me, you can find me quickly. My lab has a website with lots of information and, and uh, Penguin Random House has a website for the book. And yeah, it shouldn't be too hard to, to find me and find more information, but of course it's all in the book. Fantastic. Well, Daniel Lieberman, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. My guest today was Daniel Lieberman. He's the author of the book, Exercised. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can check out our show notes at aom.is slash exercised, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.